So we are going to talk about bats. Um, they're kind of given a bad rap. So um, there are 1400 species of bats worldwide, 47 species in the United States and 13 species in Illinois. And what we're going to do tonight is talk a little bit about um, characteristics and adaptations that they all have in common. We'll talk about some of the threats bats are facing, um, how we can help bats, how bats help us. And then finally, we'll take a look at some of our local species in Illinois. So the most amazing adaptation, of course, is they are the only mammal that is truly capable of flight. Their hands have been adapted into these wings. So you can see um, right over here, this is their thumb, pointer finger, middle finger, ring finger, and their pinky finger. And the skin that runs across is called the patagium. So um, we do, there are flying squirrels, there are other animals that are capable of gliding, no other mammal capable of true flight. Um, you also probably know bats echolocate, mammals and dolphins echolocate, and um, certain species of shrew actually do a form of echolocating. So they sing, send a signal out and they receive information back. When they find food, when it's something that they wanna eat, they're going to start sending that signal faster and faster and faster. So they get more and more information and they can pinpoint exactly where that food is and, um, and snag it up. There are some species of nose leaf bats. They actually echolocate through their noses instead of their ears. None of them live in um, North America, but they're kind of really neat looking and you've probably seen their faces, some really unusual noses. All those wrinkles just add to the surface area of what they're able to understand. And here we're gonna look just at two different features. One is the tragus. We have those in our ears as well. It's kind of protect, protecting the canal. Um, bats use them for the same thing and to help them find sounds. And the other thing I want you to notice is down here, the calker. That's a little bone spur, a little bit of cartilage that um, comes out and helps give them balance and stability when they fly. And the reason we're pointing those two out is because with our local species, those are some of the details, some of the parts you wanna look at to be able to identify our local bats. Um, and again, there's just another example, a little up close so you can see that bony spur and the keel would be this part past it. In some species, it might even be absent, but this is the part um, between their legs and tail. All but one species of bat are capable of hanging upside down. And that's actually really important for them because that is how they fly. If you think about a bird, especially like a big bird, like a pelican, they're fighting gravity every time they take off. And some of them you'll see get a big running start across the water before they can flow into flight. Bats drop down and gravity is their friend. As soon as they let go, they can start flying. So all bats, um, except one, hangs upside down. They can hang by one or two feet. And what's kind of amazing is when they lock in, that's their at rest position. So their um, toes clasped tight and hanging is at rest for them. It's not taking strength. It's, um, it's the opposite of how we would expect it to be. If a bat falls to the ground, or a bat is on the ground for some reason, before it can fly, it has to find something to kind of climb up and again, be able to drop down and use gravity as its, as its friend to start flying. Um, and here's the tragus. These are two of our local species. The one on the left, let me make sure, get to that page, is um, an evening bat. You can see it's very rounded ears, very rounded tragus. This is an Indiana bat, 
and you can see it's a little more pointed. And this is a northern long-eared bat. You can see it has a really pointy tragus. The other thing, all of our bats in Illinois, um, so bats are in the group Choroptera. It means hand wing. Um, there are megachoropterans and microchoropterans. All of our bats are microchoropterans in Illinois. All of our bats are insect eaters. So they have these sharp pointy teeth. And again, um, some bats look so similar in size and shape the dentition can be a sign in identifying them. They might have a different number of these back teeth, but they're all super sharp and pointy, so they can crunch into those um, exoskeletons of the bugs they love to munch on. Um, another one myth about bats is that they are blind. All bats can echolocate. Smaller bats really depend on echolocation more than the larger bats, but they are not blind. All bats can see. And one of the things we've learned is some of the bats um, that can do, they do both, they might depend on their sight more than their ability to echolocate. And sometimes you can get a bat crashing into a window like a bird would um, because they're not paying attention to the signals they're receiving from their echolocation. For our bats in Illinois, um, Courtship's not, not very a big deal. Some, some birds have magnificent dances. Spiders even have dances. Um, grasshoppers can do 25 different moves to attract a mate. A male might just come and kind of snuggle up behind a female or maybe just start biting her back a little. And then they mate. What's unusual with all of our bat species is their mating season is right now. So they're migrating to their winter homes, um, some to hibernate, some might stay active during the winter, but now is when they're mating. All of our species of bat have delayed fertilization. So they mate now, they hibernate or stay active. And in the springtime is when the female um, fertilizes her egg. So it's delayed fertilization. And then they all have pups, depending on the size. Their gestation period is anywhere from 60 to 90 days. So all of our bat species are having their pups between May and July. Um, most have just one or two. A few species can have um, three or four. We'll talk more about that a little later. And what they do, their behaviors are a little different. So this is a hoary bat with two pups. This is one that's actually capable of having up to five, but hoary bats stay pretty much solitary um, with just the mom and the pups. Other species of bat, like the Indiana bat, huddle in these big maternal colonies. So if you can see, this is about a square foot there can be over um, 100 bats in one square foot of space here. Another awesome adaptation bats have is that the mother, she flies out and is gonna come back um, and bring food to her young. She will be able to smell or using pheromones, find her babies out of a wall full of young children. And a mother will feed just her babies at least the first two weeks. After the first two weeks, they might help out and feed other hungry babies um, in the colony. So with many of our species, it's the moms and pups that live in the colony. The males might have just solitary bachelor pads nearby, or they might have a, a colony. They might huddle up together, but adult males are never with um, the moms and pups. This is one of the most famous places, um, Bracken Cave in Texas. It is where home to about 20 million Mexican free tail bats between the um, months of March and October. So many people come here to watch them emerge at night because when it's dark, whether you're sitting there or not, they're hungry and they're gonna come out and um, search for food. 
So this fat has a wonderfully healthy population, again, up to 20 million, the largest gathering of mammals known in the world. Um, unfortunately, not all of our bats are doing as well. Of the 1,400 species, about 200 um, are either endangered, threatened, or vulnerable species. And some of the things that are harming our local bat species are one, um, habitat loss. So just losing land, not having the places to go. Lots of our bats, they're very, um, they're very, they follow the same path every time. So a bat that's roosting in one tree in a particular forest might come back to that tree year after year after year after year. So if the tree's not there, um, they might not be able to find a new place to, to go to. So habitat loss is one of them. Um, this map though, it's kind of nice to see this dark green color is actually a net gain in forests. So that's something positive and we can be happy about. Um, I know I've worked for the Forest Preserve for 17 years. When I started, we had about 16,000 acres. We currently have 22,000. So little by little, we are restoring natural habitat for all the species around us. Some of the other things threatening bats um, are windmills. Birds have very rigid lungs. Bats do not. So when bats fly by a windmill, they actually, um, the change in air pressure can just kind of crush their, their little lungs. So when you find um, bats injured by the windmills, it is not because they flew into those blades. They can echolocate and actually see that those blades are spinning around. They think it's actually the change in pressure because of the blades that is harming them. Um, climate change, of course, is, is affecting all species on the planet. Um, the mega chiropterans, the bats that depend on fruits if they migrate and their fruit's not ripe yet because it's, the seasons um, are changing. They're not getting the food they need. And then, of course, pesticides harm bats because if they're eating insects that have been sprayed, they're getting the poison inside them as well. White nose fungus um, is hurting our bats in North America. We have um, four species that are three that are really truly affected by it. Um, their population is really declined. Um, some are a little better at fighting it off. And the trouble with white nose fungus is just that it's super uncomfortable for them. So um, when they, it takes a lot of energy to migrate and or to hibernate. You need to really store energy to migrate and then to be able to withstand hibernating and going all those months with a slowed heart rate and not requiring food. So if they wake up during hibernation, they might not be able to go back into it. Um, and so if they're uncomfortable, they're waking up a lot more than they should be. So that is one thing that's really harming a lot of our bats. It was not, um, Found It was first discovered in the United States in 2006. So um, in just 15 years, it has reduced populations of three of our species by about 90%, which is pretty devastating. Scientists are researching um, how to fight it, if we can get a vaccine to help the little bat species that are affected by it. Um, nothing, nothing, no good news yet, but some of our species are resilient to it. Some of them are not affected at all. The other thing that harms bats is people. Um, pesticides on a big farm is really bad. Pesticides in your own backyard can um, harm the habitat for bats and other species that live by. Because they're um, weird looking and misunderstood if people have bats in their house or in their roof or shed, they might just kill them and not appreciate the fact that they're a, a benefit to us. And then a lot of the problems are people who just um, like adventure, traveling to places they shouldn't and going places they shouldn't be and disrupting and disturbing bats. 
but there are many ways we can help them. Um, one is just build, um, making a habitat for them. So a lot of our bat species, again, like to huddle up really close together. So you can build a bat box like this, or you can purchase one. They're about the size of maybe like the double box of cereal. And in an area, in a little bat, bat, um, bat box like this, you can get hundreds of bats hanging out. So making um, this and putting it at your house, there's directions on how high you should have it, about 15 feet, which direction it should be facing. Um, and I do have a link to more information if you're interested in getting or building a bat box for yourself. You'll get that tomorrow. Um, this is an example of a bat hotel. One of our preserves in Will County, Hamill Woods and Shorewood has a bat hotel. Um, the bats actually moved into a pavilion nearby. Um, we wrote a grant, put in the hotel, the bats still get the pavilion. That pavilion is no longer able um, to be rented for a picnic or a party because the bats have moved in. So the bats get it. And we do um, a couple of hikes there a year. If you wanna pay attention, usually um, early August, I lead a couple of night hikes and we hike around, learn about bats, and then you can sit around the pavilion and watch them emerge. Not 20 million like Bracken Cave. Um, this year, I think the most we saw was about 50. Um, planting, a planting a bat garden is one way you can help. And here at the Forest Preserve, there's lots of places that do native plant sales, um, lots of webinars some of my coworkers do to teach how to plant native plants. And I do have another link I'll send you that shows the plants that are best in our area that would attract bats to your yard. And a lot of the ways you're doing that is by attracting the bugs the bats like to eat to your yard. So yes, they do eat mosquitoes. They also eat moths, butterflies, um, beetles, katydids, cicadas, all sorts of crunchy little bugs. So you can create a natural habitat and attract bats to your yard. You could also be a bat monitor. So you can get an app. Um, there's free versions as well, but you need this little black item, which is hundreds of dollars. And then you can attach it and monitor your bats. You can listen, it'll make their, um, their echolocating sound, which we cannot hear, audible to us. It'll give it a sound. It'll also give it a pattern. So some of them might be like you see here. Some of them might be a slanted swoop and it's going to do its best to identify exactly who you heard. So that's one way you can monitor um, who's, who's around. Um, one of my coworkers did a bat hike at Plum Creek Nature Center and they were able to hear six different species of six of the eight that live here, which is pretty impressive. Um, you can also help um, monitor bats by capturing them and they use tiny little mist nets. So they're a lot like a spider web, like you have to look the right way to be able to see the mist net. Again, the bats know they're there, so they could choose to fly around it, but most often I think they do think it's a web that they're just gonna be able to fly right through. So you can catch a bat, volunteer to help catch bats, and then they get weighed and tagged and measured. And a lot of this gives us baseline data about them. We can test and see how many bats um, that we catch have white nose fungus, if there's ways we can help them, and um, a lot more information. If you really get into studying bats, you can volunteer for programs. We do not offer any like this in Will County but there are opportunities to go monitor and count bats in their caves or mines. And there are a lot of great um, organizations you can support to help um, bat research and help provide habitats. Bat Conservation International has tons of great information about all bat species um, and 
and things you could do. So there's a lot of people working to try and restore habitat for bats and make sure they have a healthy, healthy home. And why should you help bats? Lots of people um, don't like them. They do get a bad rap. They have absolutely no interest in our hair. That's a myth. Um, but there are many, many benefits they give us. First, echolocating. Scientists study how they echolocate and we've been able to create sonar. Um, studying how echolocation works has helped um, scientists and medical research create devices that can help people who are blind navigate as well. Um, you can pay for bat poop. So bat guano is bat poop. It's um, great fertilizer. People collect it, people sell it, um, and it can help some of your plants grow. This is a cave where bat guano is collected. And one of the interesting things about it, the saltpeter, the ingredient that makes it great for fertilizer, actually made it great um, to make bullets. So in the Civil War, in the American Civil War, people used bat guano to make um, bullets. There are only three species of vampire bat. They live in Central and South America, none in the United States. In Arizona and New Mexico, we do have a false vampire bat. It does not eat blood. So you can see they're teeny tiny, usually um, only affecting cattle and birds. Um, very few minimal cases of a human being bit by a vampire bat. But their saliva has an anticoagulant in it. So when they bite their little critter, that anticoagulant helps the blood flow so they're able to drink more. So scientists have been able to study how they do that and create medicine and anticoagulants for humans to use. There's actually 80 plants that we use for medicine that rely on bats. So we'll look a little bit about how bats um, are just so important for global ecosystems. And again, part of that is helping the plants um, that we use for medicine. Bats are pollinators. So there are I've I've only heard positive things about the about the bat houses. Joseph asked a question about the bat houses if the commercially made bat houses and shelters work. Um, I have only heard positive stories of people who've put them up. They do have bats moving in. So um, I'll look more into that and see if I can find something out, but I've not. I've not heard that information. I'd love to see if you want to share with George as well what um, the research you were you're citing. So bats as pollinators, um, they are responsible for. Let me get to it so I don't say the wrong number. It's pretty impressive. There are over three hundred plants that depend on bats as pollinators. One of the most famous is this one in the corner over here. This is um, the agave plant. So if you like tequila, you have to think of bat. They are the sole pollinators, one of the sole pollinators. Um, no, when the vampire bats, it's, it's more like an annoying bite, like a mosquito biting, biting us. It does not kill the birds, it does not kill the cattle. Good question. Bats are also, oh, pants. there we go. Many bats are also fruit eaters. So as a fruit eater, they're pollinators or they're spreading seeds. There are um, some of the seeds that they help spread many nuts, many figs, and also cacao which is the main ingredient in chocolate. So by eating the fruit and flying away and pooping the seeds out in a different location, they're helping to plant new 
new plants. So we really depend on them for that. And then like all of our bats, they're super beneficial just because they're insect eaters. So they can prevent disease. Many insects carry disease. So if they eat that bug, it's not biting us and harming us. They eat lots of bugs that interfere with our agricultural crops. So we depend on them for that. Um, it's estimated in Texas about $1.4 billion annually in a service from bats and worldwide, like the high estimate is about 53 billion in services for preventing the need for pesticides and, say, and the prevention of the damage that could be done to crops. And as you'll learn when we talk more about our local species, there are some, um, some bats we know a lot about and that might be because they're actually eating a plant we depend on. And there are some that are still a bit of a mystery to us sometimes, but they are either catching them in flight or they are gleaners. So a gleaner would, this is a cicada right here. They like to live at the tops of trees. Um, Katie did, I said cicada. Cicadas also live at the tops of trees and sing during the day. The Katie did at the tops of trees singing at night, both food for bats, um, and again, lots of bats, they either catch in flight or they glean, they'll grab a, a bug um, right off its resting spot. And before we get into our local species, we'll look at just the two record breakers. So the largest bat, you can see why he's called the flying fox. If you look at that cute little face, um, they're actually a very private bat. They wouldn't be near people. So this is probably like a zoo or a conservation area. Um, only in the Philippines does this flying fox live. Its wingspan is six feet. And this is the smallest bat, the bumblebee bat, also called Kitty's hognose bat. It weighs less than a penny. And you can see how adorable that little guy is. And he only lives, or she only lives in a little area in Thailand. Do bats carry rabies? Is a question on the chat. Yes, they could. There are not very many cases. So that's one of the things that when they're collect collected, um, you can tag them and see if they have them. There's usually, um, one or two, you could actually look at, um, look it up and see how many were found with rabies each year. So they can, not very often, um, some of our critters in Will County that would carry rabies more often would be skunk or a raccoon. And that's a great time to mention if um, you should never approach a wild animal, we should respect them, we could photograph them, but you should never get close they don't want us to get close. So if they're not running away or um, trying to get away from us, that's a good sign you should get far away because it could be sick or injured because that would be unusual. So occasionally they can, um, not, as much, not as much as some of our larger mammals. And now we'll look at our local species. So the first, there are 13 in Illinois. The first five I'm going to show you do not live in Will County um, or DuPage County. So, and this is the Eastern small-footed bat. It um, hibernates in caves. It's usually the first to migrate. So the first to enter the cave, um, or last to migrate. So it'll be the last to enter the cave and the first to leave. So in lots of caves um, in Southern Illinois and in other places, there could be multiple species of bat living there. Some are gonna be all clustered in those tight colonies. Some are gonna be spaced out, but again, you might have more than one species living in the same cave. Um, what's most unusual about the small footed bat, other than its tiny little feet, is when it's eating, it's usually only three to nine feet off the ground. So most of our bats are gonna be flying much higher than that. The gray bat 
Um, it's one of the first bats to be put on the endangered species list way back in 1976. Um, and part of the problem with this one was, was humans, was humans entering the caves and interfering with them. So this one, they've closed off a lot of the caves. Some of them, they had to physically put up giant gates so people could not get in. And this one has actually rebounded since it's been protected in 1976, which is really nice. There are only nine caves in the United States where this bat migrates. So only nine for all the species. Um, it is really important to keep them protected. And it's nice to see that it is on, um, it is making a comeback. Some of our species, um, endangered species, that gets, list gets updated only every seven years. So some of the species that are um, maybe a species of great concern might be added to the endangered list when it's, when it's time and some species might be removed when it's time, but again, it's not up, updated frequently. The Indiana bat, um, this is one, this is ours that lives in like the biggest clusters in our area. It's the one I showed, um, showed you earlier where there was like over a hundred in a little square foot. Um, this one is federally endangered. In Illinois, there are 33 of our 102 counties where we have healthy populations. And again, that's thanks to organizations like the Forest Preserve that really work hard to create habitats for these species. Um, they have large dense clusters, up to 32,000 might hang out in a cave together and only have one single pup. They're one of our smaller species. All of our bats, are um, large, our smallest, I'll show you later, would only weigh about two pennies. Our largest only weighs about seven pennies. So this one's right at about three and a half pennies. The southeastern bat is um, endangered in the state of Illinois. It's a species of greatest concern. So it's one that might get endangered to the, um, might get it added to the endangered species list. They roost in a variety of habits. So um, it's one that does not like caves or mines like most of our species. It's like, it likes hollow trees, buildings, bridges, other culverts. And they're always found near water because they really like to eat the aquatic insects. So they're flying above um, the waterways to catch their food. And the last of our Illinois species that do not live in Will County is Raffinesque's big-eared bat. You can see why he got his name. Um, these guys are pretty smart because they like to live in buildings as well, but they don't like buildings where people are. So they can kind of tell the difference. They like uninhabited buildings to find little um, places up against the wall or crevices to hang out with. They're really gr great flyers, um, so they can fly around in the dense forest pretty fast, mostly um, gleaners. So these guys are mostly eating bugs that are at rest. And now we get to our local species. So this is the Northern long-eared bat. And unfortunately, this is one of the three who's really been um, wiped out by white nose fungus. The study um, I'm citing just was, there were over 33 organizations and scientists working on this study. It lasted over 10 years. And again, they found that this, and two other species are down about 90% of what their population used to be. Um, these guys live in tree cavities as well. They like dead trees. They, um, males are usually solitary or in bachelor pads, and they will ha ha um, migrate to mines and caves in Southern Illinois. So this one you can see here in the summer, um, they usually just have one Pup, and about a 10 inch wingspan, if you can picture that. So their little body 
maybe only two inches when they open their wings can be a lot larger. The evening bat, um, this one really puzzled me because this one, we don't know what happens to it. We know they're not in Illinois in the winter. They think they stay active in the winter. So most of our other species, they migrate and hibernate. They believe this one stays active in the winter, but they don't know for sure, which is pretty interesting. Um, in our area, we usually are only seeing the females and the young pups. The males never really come to this area. They hang out in a different place. So again, we don't know a lot about this one. And here is the silver haired bat. Um, this one, you can see it has a pretty big range in North America. We um, see this one just mostly migrates through. So this one is more common in Illinois in spring and fall during migration and not necessarily a resident. I think it goes farther north um, for its summer grounds. You can see it has silver at the tips of its hair. Um, and that always makes me think, um, I can remember some of this one's behaviors because silver hair, right? It's older and wiser. So when this one's flying around, it does not fly fast, but it can maneuver really well. This bat will actually adapt when it eats too. If it comes out and it seems like there's too many other bats out, too much competition for food, it'll go back to bed and come out at a different time. So it's really adaptable where some species are right after dark, some species wait a couple hours. This one um, can change its mind, see, see when the best time to eat is. This is one of my favorites. This is the hoary bat. It is named that because of the white fur. Um, it is our largest bat. So it weighs up to seven pennies and has a wingspan of up to 13, um, up to 16 inches. So pretty large. I'm gonna look and see what this other question is. Just a second. Um, yes, Joseph asked, will different species nest together in the same shelter? Yes, is the answer. Um, and what you read in books, this one, everything I've studied says this one um, does not come out until four hours after dark. At my program in August, this one was hanging out with our big brown bats um, and came out to eat right, af right after dark, right at dusk. So, um, so everything you read isn't always true. They are adaptable. Um, these, the hoary bat is more solitary though than any of our other species. Um, the hoary bat and the red bat I'm gonna show you next. What's kind of awesome is they can hide in plain sight. They'll hang by one foot in a tree like this. And you could just assume you're looking at one little dead leaf on an oak tree and it's really the bat just hanging and kind of swinging with the wind and hiding out during the day. And again, it gets dark, they drop and they can fly. These bats, um, their first flight might be a 24 mile trip. So they'll head out at night and make a great big loop around um, and come back and then maybe go back out a couple of other times to eat. They are fast flyers and not very maneuverable. So they're high, um, usually above the canopy. So they're gleaning those cicadas and katydids that are at the tops of the trees, or they like open fields, like agricultural fields where they can just fly fast and eat and they don't have to worry about a lot of obstacles. Our Eastern red bat, um, by the way, all bats, the female is ever so slightly larger than the male. And that is usually the only way you could tell them apart. Um, that's the only difference between the male and female. The Eastern red bat is a little different because the males will be a, deep, a deeper, darker red and the females will have like a lighter color to them. 
this is another one that like the hoary bat, it's a lot more solitary. Um, it will hang from a leaf or hang from a branch and swing and look like a leaf. The Eastern red bat and the hoary bat are the only two of our species that can have more than two pups. So anywhere from three to five. They are the only two of our local species that have um, more than two teats. They have four teats then, so they're able to feed more the more babies that they have. They have some strange goofy habits. Um, males and females are almost never together except, except when they're mating right about now. Sometimes the males um, don't even, like it's a big dividing line where the males will go and won't go. Something else I wanted to say about them. I don't quite remember. Um, the other thing unusual about bats is most of our smaller mammals, like a mouse, is going to have a very short life cycle. A lot of our local bat species, again, some we don't know as much about, can live at least four to five years in nature, some of them um, up to 14, some of them up to 30 years if they're um, kept in captivity. The big brown bat is our second largest bat in um, Illinois, not related to the little brown bat that you'll see ahead, but this one, there's been a lot of studies on because one of the things they eat is the larva of the cucumber beetle. Stay with me for a second. The larva of the cucumber beetle's favorite food is corn. So it gets a little confusing. They did studies to see, again, how these bats help us. And they estimated that a colony of just 150 bats eats enough larva, enough of this cucumber beetle to prevent 33, let me look so I don't get this wrong, 33 million larva in one season, 150 bats prevent 33 million larva just from being born by eating um, these beetles. We have one more question. Do bats eat any plants like flowers or fruit? None of our Will County bats. All of our Will County, DuPage, or Illinois bats are insectivores. But um, there are bats that love fruit um, there are bats that are fruitivores. Again, that's one of the ways they're very beneficial to our ecosystems by eating fruits and dispersing the seeds. And there are bats that like pollen and nectar. Um, so again, they are going into the flowers and helping to pollinate plants. So yes, they do. None of our local species. Ours are strictly carnivorous insectivores. And again, it's interesting because this bat um, affects our crops and helps our crops. We know a lot more about it. We're the evening bat. We don't even know for certain where it goes in the winter. Um, the big brown bat, the little brown bat, and the northern bat, someone asked earlier, they will all can all be found in the same caves in Southern Illinois. Um, the little brown bat, like the northern bat, this one's population has really been um, affected by white nose fungus. Um, another one with a big appetite that's been studied a lot. They estimate that um, they could eat, one species could eat up to um, 12,000 insects in an hour. I'm not sure how that study was done. So they have Maternity colonators, they're opportunistic feeders. So some bats prefer certain things. These guys will eat whatever, whatever they see flying around. And finally, my other favorite is the tricolored bat. And it is named and um, used to be named Eastern Pipistrel, which is um, Italian, Pipistrel is Italian for bat. It's been changed to tricolored bat. Each individual hair has three different colors on it. And that's why it's named that. 
This is our smallest bat. So the hoary bat was the largest with a wingspan of up to 16 inches. This is our smallest with a wingspan can be up to 10 inches still. So up to 10 inches, but this bat would be about the size of like a dad's thumb. Mine is way too small, but maybe um, about, about a, little, a little wider, slightly wider than an inch when it's all huddled up. But again, it can open up to a 10 inch wingspan. This bat, when it goes to migrate, this is not white nose fungus on its body. It is tiny little frozen droplets of water. So it's, that's perfectly fine and healthy for it to look like that and kind of pretty. Um, again, this is one that has been really affected by white nose fungus. So um, it's good to have organizations like the Forest Preserve. We have some healthy populations here. Um, a lot of places, again, creating habitat, putting habitat in your own yard that will attract the bugs and then the bats is a way you can help them. Um, if anyone has any questions, I would love to try and answer them. Thank you so much for, for coming and hanging out and learning about our cute little flying mammals. And let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. That was excellent. I really learned a lot. and. Uh, as Angela just said, does anyone have any questions? Uh, type them into the Q&A. Here's your opportunity to get your bat-related uh, questions answered. I forgot to mention when they hibernate, um, the place, uh, it's called a hibernacula, which is a very fun word to say. So. Looks like just some thank yous. Again, thank you so much for attending. And if you think of any other questions, you can always shoot them my way. Um, I love I love learning. 